Hello everyone and welcome to Who Wore It Better, the weekly segment in which I review Raw and SmackDown back to back and try and figure out which show won for the week. No Mercy is in the books and right now we have the build toward Hell in a Cell and more importantly, Survivor Series. Short disclaimer, I was not able to watch the full version of Raw Monday night. I was actually in town watching a house show for SmackDown on Monday, so I didn't watch Raw. I watched the Hulu version of Raw the next morning, the 90 minute version of it. Now a lot of stuff was cut from Raw, obviously not as much stuff from the Hulu version of SmackDown gets cut, but in the interest of fairness, I did watch the Hulu versions of both shows, Raw and SmackDown, Tuesday and Wednesday mornings, respectively, just trying to keep everything as fair as could possibly be. That being said, let's begin. Beginning with Raw, Sasha Banks, the new women's champion, kicks things off with a promo. The crowd chants, you deserve it, before she starts talking. They did the same thing with Dolph Ziggler the next night on SmackDown. I'm getting really sick of the you deserve it chants. Uh, it's too much for me. Banks challenges Charlotte for a Hell in a Cell match at Hell in a Cell for the Women's Championship. Charlotte comes out, but she's interrupted by Rusev and Lana. Rusev starts to talk, but Sasha and Charlotte each tear the microphone out of his hand. It's actually some pretty uh, entertaining stuff in this opening segment. The brief cohesion between the bitter rivals as they both drop kick Rusev out of the ring and they both take down Lana. It was some pretty good stuff. Then Roman Reigns comes out and makes the save, and that leads to the tag team match later in the night. Kofi Kingston and Cesaro in singles action as the two tag teams get ready for their inevitable tag title matchup at some point to be determined. Uh, really funny seeing Sheamus go on Facebook Live during this match, you know, obviously not caring about the well-being of his own tag team partner. Uh, the big uh, the big botch near the end, the springboard attempt by Kofi Kingston crashing and burning, considering it looked to be pretty much a botch, I don't think they planned that to happen, but they covered up for it pretty well, which is the mark of a true professional. The distraction on the outside between Sheamus and Xavier and Big E leads to uh, Kingston and winning on the distraction, uh, leading to more of that uh, tension between Sheamus and Cesaro. It's a pretty decent build what they're doing so far. Bailey taking on local talent Cami Fields, aka Holla Dead. Congratulations, by the way, are in order to all of the local talent from the California area who appeared or did dark matches during Raw and SmackDown the last couple of days. Cami Fields, Marcus Lewis, Mikey G, Matt Carlos, Will Cuevas, Will Hobbs, and Desi Dorada, who was the female plant who uh, was there uh, ringside on SmackDown during the AJ Styles, James Ellsworth match, still only getting the autograph and stuff. I'll talk about that later on. But anyway, congratulations to all those workers getting looked at by WWE. But anyway, moving on with this, the match itself was a little botchy at times, I felt. Uh, Bailey picking up the quick and easy win, but she gets jumped by Dana Brooke afterward as retaliation for last week. This seems to be the new feud for Bailey going into this. So as long as we don't keep seeing, you know, a bunch of female squash matches between Bailey and Nia Jax, you know, uh, I'm, I'm happy with Bailey moving on to an actual feud. Mick Foley wearing a ridiculous suit coming out with Stephanie McMahon in the ring. They make a couple of announcements. One, they confirm that the Hell in a Cell match between Charlotte and Sasha Banks is going to happen for the women's title. Also, that the Rollins-Owens match for the Universal title is going to be a Cell match as well. That prompts Jericho to come out and start complaining. Jericho says Foley makes the list. That gets a huge pop. The one thing I didn't like about this segment was the ludicrous inconsistency, which is the way they are showing and portraying Stephanie McMahon. A couple of weeks ago, she castrated Mick Foley on live television, and then a this one, she's putting him over big, saying he's the general manager. Da, da, da. Look, it's Mick Foley, this legend. Like, I, they can't make up their minds whether to make Stephanie a heel or a face. Even in the way she addressed Seth Rollins in this segment was with with respect, with a modicum of respect, compared to the way she talked with Seth Rollins a week or two ago. It's just not very consistent. It's one. And I have to say, it's one of the worst parts of the show when one of your top authority figures can't make up her mind how she wants to be portrayed, either as this, you know, power woman who just steps on the dicks of all the people in front of her, or she just kind of plays the face and does the yes thing. She might as well be doing the yes thing at this point because she's just so inconsistent. And to top it all off, even a couple of weeks ago when she verbally castrated McFoley, on Monday she even stole his catchphrase and his cheap pop. How rude is that? Roman Reigns and Sasha Banks taking on Charlotte and Rusev in a rare mixed tag team match. The Bay Area clearly still hates Roman Reigns with a passion. They're not going to forgive him for WrestleMania 31 anytime soon. Be that as it may, I thought it was a fun little match for what it was. I liked the Eddie-inspired gear that Sasha wore the day after Eddie's birthday. I liked the spot at the end when Sasha had Charlotte the bank statement and Roman Reigns jumped over the both of them to give Rusev a spear. You know, I think he's taken the most Roman Reigns spears in his time in the company, but nobody takes a Roman Reigns spear better than Rusev, in my opinion. But Roman Reigns and Sasha Banks win by submission. The Paul Heyman promo. This accomplished a couple of things. One, it helped plug 2K17 as if it needed any more promotion. And two, it also helped spin the wheels toward the Brock Lesnar-Goldberg matchup rumored to be happening at Survivor Series. Heyman talking about Goldberg's accolades 
All the titles Goldberg won, yes, all four of them over a very short period of time during his monster push. Uh, Lesnar challenging Goldberg via Paul Heyman. Paul Heyman saying, Brock Lesnar versus Goldberg. I think he said it a lot better than Lesnar said it a few years back. Brock Lesnar versus Goldberg! So anyway, Goldberg's gonna be on Raw next week to address the challenge laid down by Lesnar. I'm pretty excited for it. I've always said that I think a motivated Lesnar-Goldberg could be a good match. The one thing that we were deprived of at WrestleMania 20 was the fact that those two were on their way out and they didn't care that everyone knew it. They said, well, we got our money, let's just slog our way through the match. I think if the match, if the circumstances are different and if both guys are motivated to put on a good match, it could be a good match. Now the fact that this is like 12 years after after this, when Lesnar was in his physical prime and Goldberg was, you know, 12 years younger, he's 50 years old now, so I don't know how good of a match he could put on, but, you know, I'm still excited about the prospect of seeing Goldberg in the ring one more time, Haas versus Haas. I think it, it basically goes 50-50. It could be a good match or it could be an awful match, uh, but we'll have to find out at Survivor Series. Cruiserweight action as TJ Perkins fought against Arya Davari with Brian Kendrick on commentary. Of course, earlier in the night, they had the backstage segment between TJ Perkins and Brian Kendrick playing up more of their past and everything. I thought, this is a really good feud that they have going on here between Perkins and Kendrick. To me, I feel like this is the only thing about the Cruiserweight division worth watching at this point. All the other Cruiserweight stuff you see right now on Raw is just kind of window dressing. It's just kind of like there on the side compared to this one thing, which is unfortunate because considering they're trying to promote the cruiser rates as best they can, they're not really putting the different cruiser rates on equal footing with the title scene. You would like to see more cruiser weight feuds and just, you know, more on display besides just the championship match, in my opinion. But anyway, the match itself was okay. The crowd dug it, but really the story here was Kendrick's commentary and showing more of his motivations for why he's here and why he has to beat TJ Perkins and all that stuff. I thought his, it was some of the best character development we've seen from Kendrick ever in his time in WWE, either in his first run or now. I love the stuff he was doing on color commentary. The match ends with TJ Perkins beating Davari with the leg lock. Again, the crowd was into it. Uh, Kendrick doing the sarcastic applause at the end. So yeah, like I said, I'm really excited about where this rivalry is going. I just wish the other cruiserweights and the way they're being treated and portrayed could rise up to that. Main event time, Chris Jericho taking on Seth Rollins. If Jericho wins, he'll be inserted into the main event at Hell in a Cell for the Universal Championship. I do like what they're doing. They're, they're, they're teasing the dissension, the wrinkles in the story between Team Kevin and Chris, uh, all these things where Jericho's being pumped up by Stephanie McMahon, and you can see he's got these ulterior motives. I think it's brilliant stuff what they're doing now, but still, Jericho and Owens together as a team is one of the best things on Raw, probably the best thing on Raw. Meanwhile, to me, Rollins as a babyface is so-so, because now I think he's full-fledged babyface, but his motivations are so messed up, because all he's doing, the only reason he is a face now, and his justification for it is like, well, the evil authority, they picked a new guy over me, and my feelings are hurt now. It reminds me of when Orton first turned face, like way back when, when he broke off from Evolution. The only reason people were given a reason to cheer for Orton was because he wasn't part of Evolution. And we're seeing this kind of mirror, this parallel thing happening with Rollins. The only reason we're made to care about Rollins now is because, well, he's not part of the authority. Do you notice kind of a similarity? There's some, there's some overlapping. The Venn diagram is kind of very similar here. But this is still a fun match. I love watching these two wrestle each other. Uh, these guys are great to see. Um, Rollins with the springboard flying knee into Jericho and then landing right on top of him. That was kind of a brutal follow through to that spot. Uh, I think Rollins persevering in spite of Kevin Owens' interference and winning the match uh, was good to see. I mean, again, they're at least in the wrestling scene, in the wrestling sense, they are booking Rollins correctly as a babyface. So they got that going for him. They're doing with Rollins what they never did with Roman Reigns when they were trying to push him as the next main event guy. But again, Rollins winning with a roll-up, Kevin Owens jumping right after the match, and uh, Rollins thwarting him and hitting Jericho with a pedigree while Kevin Owens walks away again. Once again, fueling the dissension, the inevitable breakup of Team Kevin and Chris. I think storyline-wise, a triple threat with the three of them at Hell in a Cell would have been a more compelling thing. Uh, I'm glad they showed restraint in not having it be a triple threat, because again, we've seen too many of them in the, just in this last year alone, so I'm glad they've held off on doing that. SmackDown starts off much in the same way that Raw started off on Monday with the triumphant babyface champion, the new champion, coming down and getting the You Deserve It chant, Ick, then interrupted by his or her rival, and they both cut really good promos, then they're interrupted by somebody else. In this case, it's Dolph Ziggler coming out, getting the You Deserve It chant, 
ick. The Miz interrupts him. They both give fine promos, excellent promos on both sides of the coin. Good face promo, good heel promo. I loved it. And the Spirit Squad comes out and it becomes a handicap match. Spirit Squad, Kenny and Mikey taking on Dolph Ziggler. Pretty quick match. Uh, I, one thing I remember was David Otunga talking about all the perks he got when he was a tag team champion. Sure, Otunga, you keep telling everyone that. Ziggler wins after super kicking Kenny Dykstra. Mauro Ranallo with the call of the night saying, oh my god, he killed Kenny. Uh, then the Miz jumps Ziggler and then Heath Slater and Rhino, Slino, comes out to make the save. I thought this was going to lead to a six man uh, at the end of the night, but apparently I, I'm, I'm guessing they're going to save it for next week. Backstage, Shane McMahon and Daniel Bryan propose three separate Survivor Series elimination matches for Survivor Series, Raw versus SmackDown. You got your singles male competitors, your female competitors, and you got your tag teams. The tag team one, to me, sounds like it's going to be kind of overcut. It's going to be a huge cluster, a huge mess. I don't know how that's going to look. Uh, to me, I think having the three interbrand matches is its exciting on one hand, but at the same time, I think it's almost kind of overkill to have all that interbrand action happening on one pay-per-view. And when you have those three Survivor Series matches, you have Goldberg Lesnar, what else is your card gonna be made up of? I mean, I imagine you're gonna have the WWE Championship defended, Universal Championship defended. I don't know what's gonna happen with those titles or what other men they're gonna use in the singles Survivor Series, the tag ones. I don't even know if Raw has five tag teams, so I'm confused to see where that's gonna end up. I mean, on paper, it sounds very exciting to have all the Survivor Series. We love Survivor Series matches on Survivor Series. It's a lost art. Uh, I'm just curious to see how they're going to pull it all off and how the rest of the card is going to be affected by that. Carmella versus Naomi in singles action. The big story in this match is Nikki Bella retaliating from earlier in the night when Carmella jumped Nikki. Now Nikki comes out to distract Carmella. The distraction's enough for Naomi to pick up the victory, so now it's two victories in a row for Naomi. Uh, Botch-free match, so hooray for that. Clearly this feud with Carmella and Nikki is not over. It's very interesting this is a you know, bitter feud between the two, not for the Women's Championship. Curious to see where this goes from here. Interesting segment here. You had Jimmy Uso taking on Chad Gable in a quick forgettable singles match that had uh, Jimmy winning with Jay adding weight and leverage in the roll-up. So the Usos uh, continue their dastardly ways. Meanwhile, right after that, you had a segment with the Hype Bros and the Ascension doing kind of a stare-down thing in the locker room. I think it's really cool to have two concurrent tag team feuds going on SmackDown, neither of which have to do with the championships. That's pretty cool. On the flip side of that, though, what's going on with Slater and Rhino? Who are they going to fight out? All that's left, I think, is the Vaude Villains. Is that their next feud, or are they just kind of floating around the ether right now? AJ Styles cuts a victory speech after winning at No Mercy on Sunday. This was like a perfect heel victory promo. I think some of the best promo work we've seen from Styles in TNA or in WWE right now was on Tuesday night. I thought it was great stuff. Uh, he introduces James Ellsworth, the, you know, the Gilbert of the modern era, as uh, his next opponent for a non-title match. Dean Ambrose comes out, and basically now they make a match with Ambrose as the special referee. You know, it was a standard squash match. Ellsworth flopped around, got beat up a lot. The real story was Ambrose finding all these funny ways to kind of thwart AJ Styles and uh, basically prevent Styles from winning the match. But of course, the big scary spot of the night was the Styles clash that happened on Ellsworth. He tucked his chin instead of going out like this, and Styles, you could see he had to kind of adjust his landing just to keep Ellsworth from breaking his neck. I mean, we've seen what happens when people don't hit the Styles clash correctly. Ask Yoshitatsu about that. And so, yeah, it was kind of a scary spot. I hope Ellsworth is okay. But be that as it may, Ambrose basically hit Styles with two dirty deeds in a row. Ellsworth got the surprise victory. Again, Gilbert for the modern era. He gets the big win every once in a while. The people loved it when, when Ellsworth was getting the offense in on the very rare times he did it. So now it's going to lead, and apparently now next week, Ellsworth has a title match against Styles. I'm curious to see where that goes. Main event time, Randy Orton and Kane taking on the newly restructured Wyatt family of Bray Wyatt and Luke Harper, who returned at No Mercy. And they almost completely recreated the finish to the No Mercy main event with the blackout. Kane disappeared, and Harper showed up at his place, and there was kind of a stare down, and then Wyatt hit Sister Abigail. Orton is defeated once again by Bray Wyatt, so two for Wyatt now, which is great. Um, you know, JBL was asking, where's Kane? Where's Kane? I think the real question was, where's Kurt Hawkins? He was supposed to have his match, his, his first match on Tuesday night, and we didn't see it. I even checked the full results compared to what Hulu did. Nothing was cut from the Hulu version, so where was Kurt Hawkins? So now it's time to decide who wore it better, Raw or SmackDown. Once again, I have to say I watched the Hulu versions of both shows. Obviously, a lot more was cut from Raw than from SmackDown, but I have always said the biggest hurdle that's facing Raw every week is the time. If Raw wasn't three full hours, it'd be a lot more entertaining than SmackDown a lot of the time. Well, guess what? When I watch a 90-minute version of Raw, I find myself being more entertained by what SmackDown's doing. 
doing. So this week, yes, there is an asterisk attached to it this week, but I have to say Raw was a more entertaining show. SmackDown had some good stuff. I like the opening segment with The Miz, Dolph Ziggler, and the Spirit Squad. I like the AJ Styles, James Ellsworth, Dean Ambrose stuff. But to me, that was pretty much it. Meanwhile on Raw, I enjoyed uh, the opening bit with Rusev and Lana and the women, Sasha Banks and Charlotte. I liked the main event a lot. I liked the hype with Paul Heyman talking about Bill Goldberg. I thought there was a lot of good stuff going on on this truncated version of Raw. So again, there's an asterisk, but in my opinion, Raw wins this week. So let me know what you think, guys. Which show did you think won for the week? Do you think I should do Hulu every week, or should this just be a one-time thing and stick with the full three-hour and two-hour versions of Raw and SmackDown? Let me know in the comments section. Vote on which show you thought was better in the poll above, and be sure to thumbs up this video if you like it, subscribe to Wrestling With Regret, and buy the t-shirts at ProWrestlingTees.com. And speaking of the t-shirts, don't forget there's a t-shirt design contest happening right now. Click the link in the description to learn more about it. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.